it's about time to get started. This is the last day. Uh, we'll see how far we get. Not nearly as far as I had originally thought we might get. That turned out to have been wildly, wildly over-optimistic, but we'll do what we can. So the next thing that I want to do is to at least sketch the proof of the famous theorem of Koifman, Macintosh, and Meyer, which says that for A Lipschitz, the operator CA, that is the Cauchy integral along the, the graph of the Lipschitz function A, is bounded on L2. And in particular, we have the following estimate. This will be L2 of R because remember, this is the one where we've written it in parametric form using the coordinates induced by the graph, the Lipschitz graph. This will be less than some uniform constant times one plus the Lipschitz constant to something like, what power do I get? Fifth power. This is not optimal, but it's, you know, it's plenty fine for almost all purposes. Okay? So <clears throat> you recall that actually as a consequence of the exercise that you did yesterday, or at least you started to do yesterday, uh, we already know that this is true provided that the Lipschitz constant was sufficiently small, okay? But Coifin and McIntosh Meyer removed the smallest condition, all right? So we're gonna deduce this, or at least sketch the proof of this using uh, the T of B theorem for square functions that we proved yesterday, the, the theorem of SEMS, okay? Okay, so there are two steps. Step one, step one is a resolution of this operator as a sort of, uh, in, 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 a, in a sort of Calderon reproducing formula, right? It's gonna be, in fact, it really is a sort of Calderon reproducing formula, except that instead of reproducing the identity operator, it reproduces the Cauchy integral operator, okay? So step one is to prove the following resolution of the of the Cauchy integral operator. It's gonna be an integral from, at least formally, I'll explain in a second what I mean by this. Or how one makes it rigorous. Okay, where theta t is what? Theta t f of x as usual is gonna be, of course, we're in one dimension here. An integral against some function psi t of x, y, where in this case, psi t of x, y is gonna be um, one over two pi i, integral on r, t over x, sorry, there's no integration here, I'm just giving you the kernel t over x minus y plus i times a of x minus a of y plus t squared, okay? All right, so notice that, that psi t is in the littlewood Paley class, right? Because A is Lipschitz, that's easy to check. It satisfies the standard littlewood Paley size and smoothest conditions in the one-dimensional setting, okay? In a moment, we'll see that it actually does nice things to a particular accredited function B, and therefore, the square function associated to theta t is gonna be bounded. We'll come back to that in a second, but let me just briefly make a comment here that how do we make sense of this? Well, remember what the operator CA is. Uh, maybe I should call it G.
right? That's the operator whose L2 bottleness we're trying to obtain, okay? So what you actually do here um, is get a resolution of a slightly altered version of this thing. Let me call it CA epsilon. And the only difference is that we add an epsilon here, okay? And notice that that keeps us away from the singularity, right? If you let the, you know, along the diagonal when x equals y, you've still got an epsilon in the denominator which keeps things from degenerating. So it's actually the CA epsilon that one resolves this way and technically uh, you're actually integrating from epsilon to infinity but you get bounds in the end that are independent of epsilon and then you pass epsilon to zero. Okay? Yes? I do indeed, thank you. In fact, just for clarity, let me make that a square bracket. Thanks. Yeah, the whole, the whole business is squared, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so then, notice that, okay, if we have this kind of variant of the Calderon reproducing formula, that means we can dualize this guy, all right? So, to prove that CA, or really CA epsilon, is bounded on L2, um, we let G and H be an L2 of the line, and it's enough to consider CA of G paired with H, okay, and what we want, of course, is that this is less than or equal to a constant times Well, the appropriate dependence on the Lipschitz norm of A times the L2 norm of G times the L2 norm of H, okay? So in turn, in turn, using this, using this resolution of the Cauchy integral operator, and then after we dualize, Again, I'm going to proceed formally and pretend we can do Fubini's theorem, and in fact, if you're really going from epsilon to infinity, that's legal. Then you flip the outermost theta t over onto the h, and what you've got is this. Um, one plus i a prime theta t of g times theta t, and I'm not, this pairing here is without complex conjugation, so this is again the transpose, not the adjoint. This is at x, this is at x, um, dx dt over t. Okay, and then you use Cauchy-Schwartz, of course. And you'll have from here, one plus, the Lipschitz constant, and then what do we get? We get two, two square function estimates, or two square functions that we have to estimate. Theta t g of x squared dx dt over t to the one half times the same thing for h, but with theta t star. Okay, and so then, oh, by the way, I should mention, this proof I'm showing you is not the original proof of Coif and Macintosh and Mayer. Theirs was a hands-on proof. Their proof preceded the advent of T of B theorems. Uh, this particular proof I'm showing you is, is Sem's proof, okay? That's why he proved that T of B theorem for square functions to do this. Okay, so, so obviously what things boil down to now is that what we need here, oh by the way, another thing I should mention, how does one actually get this? I'm, I'm gonna omit the proof here today for purposes of saving time. 
Um, you can find the proof in the notes. So, proof in the notes. It's, it's a complex analysis proof, okay? It's just a matter of doing some, uh, using Cauchy's formula in a sufficiently clever way, and, and this is what comes out, okay? So it's, this is purely complex analysis here, and then writing, right, writing things in the, in the parametric form. All right? Not an obvious thing, but if you have had a course in complex analysis, you can easily read this. It's, it's elementary, even if clever. Okay, so step two then is to prove that we have the following square function bound. And similarly for for theta t star, which if you think about it for a moment, you realize is actually minus theta of minus t when you take the transpose. Can you get a square root on the left side? Uh, I need a square on this side, thanks. <laughs> thanks, whoops. Okay, and then once you have that, you're done. Okay, but how do we get that? Well, we've already observed, we've already observed that the kernel of this guy is a little with Paley kernel. Okay, so we prove this, we call this star. Okay. To prove star by theorem 4.4, .4, which is this T of B theorem for square functions, it's enough to show there exists an accretive B such that, well, in fact, we're going to do even better than just theta T of B is, is giving rise to a Carlson measure. We're actually going to have theta T of B is zero. So it's a very particular case of the very special case of this T of B theorem, okay? And what's the B that we use? We're gonna take B to be one plus IA prime. Of course, that's accretive. A is Lipschitz, so this is bounded, and of course the real part is one, which is certainly bounded away from zero. Yeah, question? Oh, oh, RN was out of habit. Yes, any place here? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're absolutely right, thank you. Yeah, that's out of habit. Our N is N is one here. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, there we go. All right. So why is this? All right, let's just see why that is. Well, okay. So let G of Z in the complex plane be the complex the constant function one, okay? So that's analytic. All right, so then what is theta t applied to one plus i a prime, okay? At say x, all right, well that's um, one over, well that's, let's pull the t out, t over two pi i times um, integral of one over um, x minus y plus i times a of x minus a of y plus t quantity squared. Um, I ran myself out of room here, but one plus i a prime of y dy. And if we set, if we take z to be the point um, x plus i times a of x plus t, and then realize that, and then parameterize as w equals y plus i a of y, what you see is that this is just t times t over two pi i 
times the integral of 1 over z minus w squared dw, right? Which by um, integrated, well, this is integrated over r, and this is integrated over the Lipschitz graph gamma, the graph of this function a. All right? But by Cauchy's formula, this is t times g prime. And g prime is 0. OK? All right, now you may worry slightly that this is an unbounded curve. How do we apply Cauchy's formula? Well, the thing is you can approximate by, by ever expanding bounded curves, closed curves. And you can pass to a limit because you have sufficiently rapid decay at infinity here. Okay? And that's the proof. All right? Um, maybe one more comment is in order. This square function estimate actually goes back to Carlos Koenig's thesis. Um, it, but on the other hand, it was, when he proved that, that was before the advent of T of V theorems. And again, you know, doing this by hand, this was a, you know, this was a serious piece of work. Um, this just shows the power of the T of B methods that, I mean, it comes out just like that once you have T of B theorems. Okay, oh, and by the way, one last comment. Um, I've glossed over this precise dependence. How do you get this dependence? Well, you go back and think about how the constants arise in the T of B theorem. It's just a matter of keeping track of the constants as they arise in the, in the application of the T of B theorem. That's how you get this precise dependence here. Okay. All right. Okay, so the last topic that we're going to discuss in the course is something called local T of B theorems. These exist for both square functions and singular integrals. We're just going to talk about the square function version. Um, it's going to turn out that the thing we're going to do is sort of a toy version of the, of the key step of the solution of the Cotto problem. Which my original plan was to talk about that, but uh, we won't get there. Uh, if you're interested, it's, it's in section six of the notes, which we will not get to, okay? But this already sort of gives you some idea of some of the, uh, or, you know, gives you an indication of some of the essential ideas that underlie, underlie that proof, okay? Um, okay, so what do I mean by a local T of B theorem? So remember the T of B theorem, say of SEMS, um, entailed finding some particular accredited function B on which your your square function operator behaved nicely, okay? You found some single testing function. So the idea of a local testing, a local T of B is that you find a family of testing functions. Typically indexed by the dyadic cubes, all right? So for each cube, there's gonna be a different testing function. And instead of sort of having globally good behavior of your operator acting on this one accredited function B, what you allow is that you just need to know that on a per localized to a particular cube Q, your operator acts nicely on the on the testing function associated to that particular cube Q, okay? So the good part of this is it gives you a lot more flexibility. I mean, in principle, you know, it's a lot easier to find, to find a particular testing function that works nicely locally than to find just one that works well globally. Um, the drawback is that, of course, the, the proof, be, you know, you have to pay a price somewhere. So the proof becomes a, a bit more delicate, but it's not too bad, you'll see. 
All right, we just have a couple of additional ingredients here. Okay, so um, the first thing what we want to do is to prove um, a certain lemma, which is, what's my numerology here? Lemma 5.1. And this is a John, this is a sort of John Nirenberg lemma. For Carlson measures. Okay. And what do I mean by John Nirenberg lemma before we get into the proof? If you recall the John Nirenberg lemma, the classical John Nirenberg lemma about BMO, the idea is this. Frequently in harmonic analysis, if you have some kind of local scale invariant estimate that works on every cube in a scale invariant way, then it can self-improve somehow. So with BMO, of course, the self-improvement is that having the BMO estimate self-improves to give you uh, a, an LP or even an exponential BMO estimate locally. All right, so we're gonna see a similar sort of self-improvement phenomenon here. Okay, so the situation is this. Let mu be a non-negative measure on the half space, Rn plus one plus, um, and we're gonna suppose that there exists constants, what am I calling the constants? C1 and eta, two positive constants, such that for every dyadic cube Q, in Rn, we have the following. For every dyadic cube Q, there exists a family F, or to be specific, F sub Q of dyadic cubes QJ. These are going to be non-overlapping dyadic subcubes of Q. Such that, first of all, the measure of a set that I'll call EQ, which is the complement in Q of the union of the QJs, the measure of that set is at least an eta portion of the measure of Q. So the QJs are failing to cover up some ample portion of the measure of Q, some eta ample portion of the measure of Q. And second, such that our Carlson, or, well, our measure mu behaves like a Carlson measure, perhaps not on all of the Carlson box associated to, to Q, but on some set, which I'll explain what that is in a second. where this EQ star is defined to be the Carlson box RQ associated to Q minus the union of the Carlson boxes associated to the QJs in this family F. Okay, and remember, remember here RQ is the Carlson box Q cross zero length of Q, right? It's the n, n plus one dimensional cube associated to Q. Okay? So then the conclusion is that, in fact, mu is actually a Carlson measure. I should have said such that for all Q, 
we have this, okay? Then, in fact, mu is a Carlson measure. with, first of all, the dyadic Carlson norm of mu, which is by definition the soup over all Q dyadic of mu of RQ divided by the measure of Q. This is gonna be less than or equal to C1 over eta. And in fact, then the full, I should say C dyadic, C for Carlson. Okay, and then the full Carlson norm of mu, which is the same thing, but taking the soup over all cubes Q, that's gonna be less than or equal to some purely dimensional constant times C1 over eta. And the fact that the last one comes from this one is a very easy exercise. For Carlson measures, it's enough to test on dyadic cubes. If you have a dyadic Carlson measure, then it's a Carlson measure, okay? That's easy to check. All right, maybe I'll stick with these names. Okay, so let's prove this. All right, so uh, by the way, again, what's the self-improvement? Well, the self-improvement is that you're, you're initially not, you, you, you're given a priori, not that mu is a Carlson measure, but that there's this sort of ample subregion of RQ where mu behaves well, where mu behaves in a good way. And since this happens in a scale invariant way for all cubes, it turns out that this self-improves to give you that the fact the thing actually is a Carlson measure, okay? So maybe I should start with a picture just so you see what's going on. All right, so here's the cube Q down here. Here's the Carlson box R Q. And we have some cubes Q J here. And we're removing their associated Carlson boxes, okay? And there's still an ample portion of contact here that's not covered up by the QJs. And then the EQ star is this part up here, this sort of sawtooth, dyadic sawtooth domain, okay? All right. So how do we prove this? The proof is quite easy. Then you just do the natural thing. All right. So what you do, of course, we're trying to, again, as we said, it's enough to work with Q-dyadic. Okay? So, of course, you're trying to control the size of mu of RQ. All right? So you split it into two pieces. There's the piece in EQ star that is the sawtooth region, and then there's the part that's covered up by the RQJs. Right? So now, by assumption, by hypothesis, this part is less than or equal to C1 times the measure of Q. And now we use the fact that this happens this hypothesis holds in a scale invariant way for every cube Q. So it holds again in the QJs, so we iterate. So we have here sum over J of mu of the associated sawtooth for QJ, EQJ star, okay, plus a sum over J, and then for each QJ, it has a family FQJ that we're now gonna index by I, say. And you'll have mu of R QJ I. Okay? So where the, oops, Q 
QJI. Uh, maybe I should, sorry, reverse the roles of the J and the I here. Put J up top and I here. Where this thing indexed by I is the family associated to the cube QJ. Okay? And now let's see what kind of estimate we have so far. All right. So in turn, this is going to be less than or equal to what? Well, we have C1 times the measure of Q. And then what is this guy? Well, this is less than or equal by hypothesis applied to QJ. This will be less than or equal to this sum on J of C1 times uh, the measure of the QJs. And then we have plus the other bit. QIJ, okay? But now, how big is this? Notice that the complement of the union of the QJs is at least this big. And the QJs are not overlapping, so the sum of the measures of the QJs is less than or equal to one minus this, okay? So this is less than or equal to, this is less than or equal to C1 times the measure of Q times one from here, plus one minus eta from here, plus this bit. Okay, and now you iterate, right? When you iterate, you get C1 times the measure of Q times this convergent geometric series. And then you're done. Okay, you just added that up, and that's the bound you get. Okay. So now, let's state the T of B theorem, the local T of B theorem. And what's my numerology here? Theorem 5.5. Okay, so as usual, we're gonna let theta Theta of T, theta T of F be defined by an integral in Rn of some kernel psi T of xy, f of y dy, and psi T 